Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of IBD Heal, a podcast brought to you by High Carb Health. I'm your host, Shakul, and today's guest is a good friend of ours going all the way back from New Zealand, Serge, who's developed the Power Surge method. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, and good to chat again. Yeah, man, always good to see you. Well, Serge is, uh, I believe, one of the best PTs I've ever come across. His theories on how body movement and and the things he's able to do is just exceptional. And you know, hopefully, uh, Serge, I can get some clips to show the audience uh, some of the cool things that you're able to do with your body. Uh, but um, one of the things he said to me, I, um, I, I'm not going to, you know, um, give him credit for this quote. I don't know who said it, but he always tells me, "Movement is medicine." and motion is lotion so let's just hear a little bit about what you do and you know why you got so passionate about the body and and moving the body yeah yeah sure um yeah so it's actually not my quote the movement uh is medicine has obviously been around for generations and motion is lotion i think i've come across that on some uh stretching uh websites and it just said timeless wisdom. Anyway, I, I, I thought that resonated with me quite well. So, because, you know, since young, um, since being a teenager and little kid growing up, I used to just move around, be active all the time, running around, playing sports and, you know, all sorts of um, different sports growing up, playing football, table tennis, ice hockey, volleyball, taekwondo, running. And it's just, you know, that i grew up doing that you know but then i uh, had a bit of a um, dark sort of um period of my life where you know i just fallen off the bandwagon you know I, I didn't achieve what i wanted to achieve with my soccer and because i wanted to become a professional football player and uh, soccer player so that kind of fallen through and so i started working in the bar and then one thing led to another i just became super unfit and and um got into trouble um with police and at that time i was fully like just anxious and depressed uh to to the point of suicide and the only thing that kept me really um sane in my mind and focused and the reason why i'm still here is because of the movement because every time i moved i felt a little bit better because I went into community alcohol and drug services where I had to sit down and listen to people talk about their problems and how they became alcoholic. And then that was my um, course for 12 weeks where I went for, um, yeah, 12 weeks in, in duration. And, uh, and the only thing that kind of kept me focused and motivated was my movement practice, um, the gym that I eventually started working at are later down the track so yeah i think we underestimate how powerful the the movement practice is and if you think about it quite clearly everything that is happening right now as we speak our eyes moving our brain functioning our breathing everything is movement without movement we wouldn't be existing in this physical realm you know and that's quite philosophical if you look at it that way but it is um what makes us alive we are movement from the point we get up to to the point when we sleep you know different types of movement from different types of uh different parts of the day so that's why i'm passionate about it because not many people kind of understand how big the movement practice is in daily life for all the people you know yeah yeah absolutely and um so from going through a bit of a rough experience early on in your life and you used movement as your way to to bring yourself out of that and obviously you know at some point um you know you realized that a shift in nutrition was quite important too uh but talk let's just talk about uh what your method is what is the power surge method so the power surge method really is um, just a combination of uh, mobility, strength, conditioning, and obviously uh, nutrition, and also some form of somatic training, which is meditation, breath work, 
uh, bringing different modalities together because at the end of the day, we're not just, you know, thinking about smashing our bodies, but also we need to slow down and uh, allow the body to adapt and also take into consideration that recovery is where the magic happens sometimes. Mm. You know, you're stronger in the duration where you recover. It's not the other way around. Obviously, you've done the work, the hard work, but then you need to um, allow that time, that time frame to for the muscles to adapt and for the neuromuscular connection to adapt and also for muscle to repair. So that's kind of like in brief what I do. Um, more so mobility, strength and conditioning and then some aspect is on nutrition because there's so much you can do to help people. But I find that even just starting with movement is already for some people it's too much because some people don't move at all and then mm. they come and see me like you know i never stretch you know how how do i start stretching or how do i start moving in general and then you give people some basic understanding of, of movement and most of the people just need to move it doesn't need to be complicated because at the end of the day, body doesn't recognize this is a bicep curl, this is a pull up. At the end of the day, the body recognizes movement and that's what it matters. Mm. How you move and what you do, as long as you love it, as long as you enjoy it, this is what I kind of tell to my clients. Like, if you enjoy doing squats, you do squats. If you enjoy doing this form of dance, you enjoy doing that because it's again, it's what you enjoy doing. But at the same time, I try to give people uh, good ranges, improve their ranges so they move well without pain and also get them to understand a little bit about their bodies a lot more because a lot of people at the gym limit themselves to linear movements mm. and just moving in a robotic, strict and, and very rigid way. Mm. But at the same time, we don't soften ourselves, we don't relax. And don't let go of that tension because, again, we're in a high-pressured state during the day, whether it's job, whether it's family, whether it's your boss, you know, screaming at you, and then you've got kids. And some people don't get enough sleep. So, you, again, you need that calming response into the body and stretching and somatics and breath work, all of that kind of slows down, slows you down and brings you inward. Because then, again, you'll be, you'll be a lot more present when you train, when mm. you have that other yin practice, coming practice, parasympathetic, which is what the people should be more in our daily life rather than sympathetic, which is more fight or flight response, mm. adrenaline driven existence. Yeah, not, not enough people understand the whole idea of um, enabling that parasympathetic aspect of the body and, and just calming down and getting out of that fight or flight. Now, I mean, you just mentioned some really important things there where you talked about that most people's idea of working out is that robotic at the gym, on the machines, you know, doing the weights. And that was me too. You know, in my younger days, I went to the gym and they had all these machines and this is what you're supposed to do. Um, what should people be thinking about if you're going to the gym? And, and, you know, there may be a place for some of those machines in certain areas, but what would you kind of recommend to someone who wants to go to the gym and, and, and improve their strength and conditioning or is already going to the gym? If you don't know, if, yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, look for a really good coach on the mm -hmm. floor because, and if you don't know what a good coach looks like, it would be a coach who's fully present with their clients and not leaning against the machine and giving all their attention and obviously getting the person to move really well and without jolted movements and getting them to move in a controlled manner without any sort of um, weird looking, you know, exercises. And of course, there's many different types of movement and machines do serve their purpose sometimes in a sense of accessory work or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, I, and I would say that, again, like let's say someone comes and sees me for performance or even just improve their posture or whatever that, that might be. Um, there's so much information 
online that it gets people to, to, to confuse themselves in terms of what should I be doing, what I should not be doing. But again, we need to simplify it because simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So get them to the patterns like squatting, hinging, lunging, hanging, uh, gait, locomotion, some form of locomotion, which is crawling or running, um, pushing, pulling. Those are kind of like gives you that global approach to your practice. And then after that, you, you get to integrate all of that. So for example, if I'm doing bicep curls, that's an isolated exercise, but then pull-ups is more integrated approach, right? Because you're using mm. a lot more muscles, you're mm. using a lot more joints. And then you can get to, to the stage where later down the track, if you know what you're doing and you've got a good coach, you can improvise, which is again, another topic you can get into. And this is what we do as kids. We improvise. We tend to not think of choreographed movement or executed in our, in our brain or premeditated, you know, that movement that we already thought about, but it just comes to you naturally, which is what dancing is sometimes if you look into it. If you don't have any choreograph, you just move and you exist. Mm -hmm in the present moment and you just improvise as you go, which can be a little bit weird in the gym setting, but at the same time, if you are going into the gym, just maybe find a different corner and just explore, pick an object and explore, pick a stick, rotate your spine, go on the bar, passive hanging big. And if it's too strenuous on your lats, just do passive hanging with your feet on the floor, you know, assist it. So there's a point in time where progression obviously is necessary, but then you need to regress as well. Sit in the squat, lunge, body weighted, push-ups, you know, all of that sort of simple stuff leads you to more comprehensive stuff later down the track. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so you know, a lot of people that are watching this um, or listening to this on the podcast, they've got, you know, possibly got some digestive issues, some gut issues, and they may be thinking, okay, well, um, my weight is low and I'm wanting to put on a bit of weight or I want to just get into some gentle strength and conditioning. I've got an uh, autoimmune condition that makes it hard for me to move in, in, in many different ways. Uh, what is, I guess, the gentlest way to start just getting into some form of movement that's not going to overstress your body or overwork your body or make it um, tired? but just allow you to keep that, I guess, motion going? Mm, yeah, it's a good question because um, I guess a lot of people would want to put on the weight and then they, they would think they need to lift heavy. But again, mm. if you strip back machines and take the machines out of the picture because machines existed only in the 20th century, we, we designed them. The old school way of bodybuilding is the body weight movement. Mm. So you just need gravity and resistance and then you get into that mode where you can do the repetitions so more repetitions and volume and if it's becoming easier there's different progressions to uh, i guess make it a little bit harder hmm. in the sense but body weight movement has always existed you are the machine you don't need the machine you are the machine so you just need the floor walls and maybe a bar or gymnastics rings and you can start doing simple things and again it's a long-term game it's not a short-term game you need to understand that body adapts slowly the tendons and ligaments take about six to twelve months to develop muscle takes about 12 weeks to develop so again you need to understand that this is a long-term thing and you need to start slow and build up mm. that momentum get into that good habit because the habit is what matters the most and general movement. General movement can be as simple as cat cows, like movement through the spine, rotational movement with a stick, mobility stick through the back. You know, those simple things. And then you start to do like the push ups, the lunges, the squats. And then you can add weight into it as you go. Um, because again, you just need the resistance. And resistance equals, there's no such thing as switch on and off button on your muscle. Right, so you're still stimulating the muscle if you move and resist under resistance. 
you've got your own body weight. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, there's so many things you can now see on YouTube. Um, I've got some um, body weight exercises on my YouTube channel and people can just find calisthenics, gymnastic strength training um, in a safe manner, of course, and, and try to see what looks good because at the end of the day, you can kind of see what looks really beautiful or looks really ugly um, from the point of view of a person who doesn't know what they're doing. Hmm. Um, but again, look for beautiful movement, um, full depth, no jolted movement, really controlled squatting, lunging, push-ups, planks, side planks, all those sort of things are really going to get you into the general movement. Um, because again, you might not be able to have that energy to sustain a weighted exercises. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what about question? just in general? Like, yeah, in a way, um, some some people may not be able to do any kind of strength stuff, so they may not be able to get yeah. into the body weight stuff because they're really weak yeah. or, um, you yeah. know, and not feeling great. Um, but what about just yeah. getting, you know, if you're just able to get outside for maybe 10, 15 minutes? What kind of things can you just start to do in terms of maybe just go for a walk walking. or walking, walking, yeah? Walking. Yeah. 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 Walking is the safest and the best medicine on the planet because again, you also got this system in, in ingrained into your body, which is called lateral eye movements. And there is a psychologist uh, who developed this method called EMDR and it's uh getting people to relive their traumas um, and using lateral eye movements and scanning a pencil moving in front of your eyes and it mitigates the post-traumatic stress response and reliving that stress or that trauma from the past by using lateral eye movements calms the nervous system down for some reason. And it's got to do with this evolutionary system that we've got. We've got eyesight, which um, when you're walking or propelling forward, um, you're scanning for danger. And mm -hmm. when you're scanning for danger, it actually calms the nervous system. So the easiest way to relax, get into the better state, is to go for a hike or walk and scan through the environment, which is your natural lateral eye movement, because this is what we naturally do without thinking. Mm. Um, and again, the walking is the underestimated, uh, underutilized form of exercise, and it's good for you, um, for mm. sure. So the first thing I guess someone should do if they just want to get moving and they have enough strength to get outside is is to go for a yeah. walk. That's beautiful. What about yeah. um? Yeah, totally. what about, yeah. Sorry, he says that you finish. And this is, it's, um, you've got mitochondria, which is your engine of the cell. And there's three things that the body needs. Your mitochondria needs is essentially is the sunlight, water, and electromagnetic connection to the planet. So grounding. So you take, go to the park, take your shoes off, bare feet on the grass, and just go for a walk in the sun. You'll feel so much better. Your mitochondria functions better if you get into those sort of things because, again, mm. there's a reason why we call it grounding when the, the, the wire is grounded because, there's again, there's electromagnetic discharge going to, into the earth and we're electric beings. We need that. And there's proven ways to show that inflammation actually drops down through the body when you ground yourself by walking on the grass in the sun, getting vitamin D, um, first thing in the morning when there's no high sort of um, ultraviolet light, just, you know, first thing in the morning, like maybe 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. when you're getting that, that first light in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and your mitochondria will thank you for it because, again, that's the foundation of the mitochondria. It's the water, sunlight, and electromagnetic connection um, mm -hmm. to the planet. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about grounding because I know you're a big proponent of taking the shoes off and, and yeah. being on the earth. And uh, can you talk about some of the other benefits that people can find just by having that connection to the earth? Well, because you discharge yourself into that, into the earth and you, um, you will get the anti-inflammatory response in your body. Uh, there's research that shows that people from all sorts of conditions, um, 
starting to feel actually better. Um, and I know that there's a, a physio in New Zealand, Nigel Beach, who works with All Blacks and he recommends getting a mat which connects to your socket and it's a grounding mat and you actually sleep grounded because it's connects to the socket. Um, and there's benefits behind that as well. It, it improves your immune system. There's many, many benefits that you can mm. talk about it. Um, but mostly it all goes back to inflammation. And mm. I know that people with IBS and Crohn's, it's, you know, inflammation, uh, inflammatory response. So if that's gonna, you know, help them in that, that case, then so it be. So um, there's actually a good documentary by Clint Ober and he wrote a book on, on the grounding. You can check it out. Um, mm. it's, it's phenomenal. And they talk about people with allergies and all sorts of stuff that starting to feel better from just grounding daily and, and walking bare feet on the grass and connecting to the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not and, one of those uh, crazy things that I'm <laughs> not going to do anything. I mean, it's just getting good yeah. on your feet, you know? No, I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, you take everything back to nature. We're not designed to have shoes. So shoes exactly. are a man-made thing. So when you, you know, anytime there's a question mark for me when it comes to research or evidence or anything, I take it back to first principles, look at nature. Does it make sense? Is it logical? Is that how we're designed to have a function? And if the answer is yeah. no, then then you then there's some question marks there, you know. Um, so in terms of you know, you talk about walking, uh, and you've also talked about stretching. I think maybe those are probably the best places to start, I think, in terms of people who are not well and they just wanted to get get kind of started into a bit of motion. But emotion is lotion uh therapy. Um, but you know, some one one of the most interesting things you taught um both me and Shamiz was you know it comes to walking um is the gait and how the body's designed to move and um you know you, you showed us this kind of movement called gota um i yeah. believe it stands for greatest of all time athletes um yeah. but i'd like you to kind of explain to the audience what this means and you know um we may be able to show you a little bit of footage as we as you go through but um just just kind of explain the importance of this movement pattern yeah, so it's actually not um, my term, but it's, it comes from uh, another Instagram account called Goda, and it stands for greatest of all time athletes. And it's basically an observation from a coach, Gil, um, who found out that one of the best and top athletes in the world um, actually move in the natural way, in the sense that we are not just linear beings, we also spiral as we progress as we propel forward in terms of the walking, in terms of the, um, in terms of the running sort of gait, sort of movement, locomotion. And if you look into nature, we always see the spiral movement. Um, and the spiral movement is present in, in many things like even tornadoes or hurricanes, which is why they're so powerful, right? They move linearly, mm. but they spin. Mm. Um, you've got the vortex, you've got, even the Fibonacci sequence, which is present. And again, it's a spiral movement. So when you're walking forward, ideally, you will see some form of rotational movement. Your shoulders are rotating, your torso is rotating the opposite ways. And your foot is actually meant to um, pull through into um, what we call um, inside ankle bone high which is when you see that people have um, their inside ankle bone and outside ankle bone, and you will see that the ankle bone is higher than lower. Because when the, the bone is low, that means that you're collapsing through your feet, which is what you'll see mostly in the people with flat feet, right? But then also, you when you're walking, you have to have hip extension and also internal rotation through your hip, right? And many, many people, because they're training improperly and they're training more external rotation. So you'll see uh, girls nowadays work, working out with those glute bands and they squat with those glute bands around their thighs. And what that does is it drives the femur into external rotation, which doesn't make any sense because we, mm. we don't need more external rotation. And if you splay your feet out, then you'll start to collapse through your, um, through your feet 
And so what you'll see is when people are squatting, they tend to just externally rotate their feet. And what happens then, your feet collapse. And if you observe the, the bottom, of your, um, bottom of your foot and sole of the feet will actually have the padding on the outside, right? It shows you something. And it's just observing and, and seeing that there's no um, protection on the inside of the foot shows you that we should be ideally more on the outside of the foot, on the heel, on the outside of the foot, and on the front where the toes are and gripping it. So that kind of sort of sums it up because, again, if you look into Michael Jordan, you, you will see that he always had his feet inward. Uh, you will see Simone Biles, who is the one of the greatest um, gymnasts for U.S. Uh, Olympics gymnastics team. You'll see when she's jumping, her feet are actually internally rotated rather than externally rotated. And, um, and you'll see that the femur, the bone of the thigh bone is actually internally rotated a little bit as well. Uh, Michael Jordan used to stand and kneel forward and his feet used to be internally rotated and used to jump in the air with the ball and his feet internally rotated. So you will see that movement of internal rotation happening at the feet. Uh, some of the swimmers um, are also doing that and their uh, arms are more internally rotated. So again, we are not just linear beings. We are more um, spiral and we're not moving in the, this rigid way, you know what I mean? Um, so if you even want to get into running, just observe what your heel is doing. If your heel is flicking towards the same hip, not the opposite hip. So if you even just set up a phone from the back and film yourself slow motion and observe what your heel is doing, if it's pointing, if your back leg is pointing with the heel towards the opposite hip, then you know that you're trying to externally rotate rather than internally rotating. You're not flicking the heel towards that same hip. So those are the things that you can kind of see and, and do uh, and observe and your foot should never collapse. If you start to see the foot collapsing, again, you need to understand that maybe it's got to do with unstable, uh, sorry, um, something is, might be going on in your hip, but then also in your feet because the feet and every joint in the body has a purpose. So you will have your feet's meant to be stable, your ankles meant to be mobile, your knees meant to be stable, your hips meant to be mobile, lumbar's meant to be, or the lower back's meant to be stable, thoracic's meant to be mobile, shoulder blades meant to be stable, shoulders meant to be mobile. So if we reverse engineer and we walk with our uh, fashion shoes and you'll see that what i'm wearing is very minimalistic in terms of the shoes you have a toe hinge going on there's no heel elevation and you're very like feeling a lot of the things that's happening on the ground when you walk bare feet or minimalistic shoes so you'll actually become more stable through the feet and so when you wear the shoes that are padded that are um, um, more cushiony there's no toe hinging going on because you'll see that a lot of the shoes have this slopey sort of front and it just gives you to push off really nicely with a toe hinge um, it makes the foot unstable so again when you take the shoes off your arches and everything will be so weak so it's orthotics which again makes everything weak um, and then you will see that that arch will collapse you know there's so many issues with the knees that later down the track that mm. might happen as well yeah but yeah i was gonna ask you about shoes actually but again it's 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 it sometimes you need to just observe and again get into the coaching because some of the coaches can destroy you and mm. give you something wrong and you need to look out for coaches that teach good movement because again the movement itself is not right or wrong but then there's also natural movement kind of puts you into that good position, more biomechanical sort of position, what you naturally should be doing. And you will observe it in animals as well. They naturally do it. They spiral into the movement rather than out of the movement when they're walking. So if you can walk and you observe someone, if, there's, if they don't have good hip extension because we're sitting too much behind the chair driving, our hips become too tight, we can't extend our hip 
then we, we rotate out with our legs because we want to propel forward, but there's no hip extension. So mm. we kind of see this outward movement to the side sort of people. Um, and you will see there from the back, you will see the outside of their foot. So you will see their Nike swoosh or Adidas from the back, whereas it should not be seen because your feet are internally rotated slightly or straight. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to talk about shoes because um, it's one thing you uh, got us uh, to look into was the type of footwear that we're wearing and you just explained everything. You know, your shoes should be, you know, is that a good place to start if you want to start to look at um, strengthening your feet and your the rest of your legs and your hips and just start move, wearing those kind of minimalistic they're called barefoot shoes aren't they um, you're trying to trying to get into those kind of shoes that kind of footwear yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean I don't, I don't I don't particularly recommend any particular shoe as long as it's minimalistic and as long as it's it's not constricting your feet. It's not um, squishing your toes at the front. It's not elevating your heel at the back. It's not cushiony. It's not rigid. And toes at the front are hinging. So again, barefoot is the best way. Um, if you're training, try to avoid any soft ground in terms of the um, like bossom balls or bouncy mats. Because again, your foot's meant to be stable on the ground. The only time when the ground will be unstable is if you're probably like surfing or on a slack line or if you're if there's an earthquake, then your body freaks out because there's something going on. But again, the foot's meant to be stable. So if you're doing lunges or squats, try and be as minimal as possible with your shoes or even barefoot. You know, some, some gyms are a little bit pedantic about taking shoes off because it's a health and safety risk. But again, um, get minimalistic shoes, flat shoes with no complicated, you know, orthotics that's going to put you into that unstable. Because again, some of the shoes you can see nowadays have like real thick soles and they're cushiony, real cushiony. You can see that people just lose that connection through their feet. Because again, it all goes back to the brain connection, right? And you've got one of the largest nerve one of the largest amount of nerve endings is in the feet. It's like 9,000 nerves in your feet. So you, mm. you're actually meant to feel the ground. And um, you're creating dexterity with your fingers when you're playing the piano, but this is essentially what you do with the feet when you're walking around and feeling the environment with your feet. So, yeah. No, it's a fascinating thing. I think um, anyone who's wanting to find ways to strengthen their feet and their and their legs and just improve the stability of their body needs to look into this barefoot movement and and look at e exactly. either walking barefoot as often as you can or you know if it's a cold climate getting barefoot shoes so that you can you can get the yeah. benefits of that um as often as possible um i've even seen people with the barefoot shoes they have like a, a grounding pin that they put into it so they can ground while they walk as well it's quite a yes. Uh, yes. it's quite a cool thing um now onto the final topic I wanted to discuss with you today. Obviously, movement and and just flowing with the body is is and and body weight work is what you recommend um, as as the optimal way to build strength and conditioning. Um, you're also quite strong in in your nutrition understanding, and you've used nutrition to you know grow your own body and help many different you know hundreds of people um, throughout your time you've been doing this. So um talk about the role nutrition plays in in helping the body to move and and grow stronger um yeah so in terms of the nutrition side of things i think um when i was depressed back in the days so I've, I've seen a good video from nutritionfacts.org actually um from michael greger and and he had a really good video on depression. And um, I, I remember that stood out for me quite a lot. And this is when I was transitioning to the, the vegan diet um, in 2012, I believe, uh, 2013. So he basically explained in the video that from the evolutionary standpoint of view, it doesn't make sense for humans to get depressed 
uh, because again, if you're depressed, you're self-destructive, right? So mm-hmm. we just destroy mm-hmm. ourselves when you're depressed. So it doesn't make sense for survival. Um, but in the sense of what it does make sense is that it actually tells you something. It's a protective mechanism. Your body is telling you that you need deep rest from toxic environment. So an environment can be internal and external. And one of the most profound effects on the body is your internal environment, which is what you consume in terms of the food. And what I found is that um, your food can either cause inflammation or, you know, reduce inflammation. And so one of the top ways to reduce inflammation in the body is to eat plant-based, which is alkaline diet, um, which is, again, brings down inflammation, gives you the right nutrients. Um, you can also do a real simple test, which is um, doing the test, the C-reactive protein test, the CRP levels, which is elevated generally in the people with anxiety and stress, and it will be elevated uh, in people with depression. So it's a well-known fact. You can do a CRP test with your doctor, I believe. Uh, and that does get increased with animal food consumption. So re- C-reactive protein increases, and so is your um, uh, IGF-1 growth hormone, which is, again, uh, is more prevalent in depressed people. So this is the stuff that I, this video kind of made me realize that I should be eating slightly different. And again, mm. at that time, when I was transitioning to vegan diet. I also could stop consuming alcohol. And, um, and it made a massive impact on my mental health um, allowed me to recover faster and and not get as sore in the gym and and i was able to actually sustain more endurance um endurance um, type of movement a lot more than if i was to consume heavy rich animal fat sort of foods so and even now I'm, i'm still learning about nutrition as i go and like lately I've been incorporating more fasting. So I don't eat up until midday. Um, so allow myself to get into the fasted state, even in intermittent fasting. So to bring down the inflammation, to have less insulin in my body circulating because I'm, um, I want to also incorporate longevity into my, uh, into my routine. So again, it's, it's simple, but then some people make it too complicated. So mm. we've got this beautiful variety of fruits and vegetables on the planet. And even your shape of the hand is like reaching for the apple on the tree, grabbing it and smelling it and eating it because this is just like intuitively is good for us. We can see the colors, we can smell, we can taste the sweetness of the fruit and vegetables and uh, which contain antioxidants and nutrients and all of that sort of stuff. So for me, it makes sense to continue eating this way and uh, and perform on a high level. Because again, I'm in the and I'm in the gym, and I don't look like I consume just plants, you know. And and some people just get shocked. Like for example, the other day um, I had the conversation with uh, a client, and she said, "Well, what do you eat?" Um, we were talking about clean diets and the client said, well, I eat very clean. And I said, Mm -hmm. what do you mean by eating clean? Because everyone's definition of clean is very different. And she said, well, I eat this. And I said, well, I haven't eaten anything. And it's right now I still haven't eaten anything. And it's already one o'clock almost. Right. And for Mm -hmm. some people it's, wow, this is, this is dangerous. But if you look into science now, it shows that the longevity side of things and, everything else the plant-based diet eating less and and also reducing inflammation those are the things that you should be incorporating more eastern approaches than the western diet which is rich in animal based mm. proteins fats and processed gmos and all of that sort of stuff so i just want to have superfoods which is your most amount of nutrients per bite and this can be spinach, it can be mushrooms, it could be uh, celery, it could be um, bananas. It could, and if this is your superfood because it, it gives you the nutrients per bite, some mm. 
fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds and herbs contain more nutrients per bite than the others, and that's why they call superfoods. But again, we can heal ourselves from the inside by consuming by consuming the right nutrients from plants and and vegetables and fruits and legumes and beans and so much variety of it. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Okay. So the main <laughs> that you get asked this often, uh, but uh, in terms of building the body and building strength you only eat plants but you know Serge how are you going to get enough protein like how have you found the whole idea of the protein kind of craziness uh in society today and and your own journey of building a very strong body on a plant-based diet yeah it's I mean it's a good question because people don't know any better and that, that's all they hear about is the protein protein mm. protein you eat protein which makes sense right because it's mm. all important you know the fiber is important the carbohydrates are important the water is important the fats are important and um recently i've done a dna test which um actually showed me that i'm more pro inflammation in terms of my body so whatever i do if i sleep less or or um, eat the wrong foods, I'm actually going to get inflamed quite fast, which makes sense because I've mm. got, you know, issues with my health over the, the years and, and, and it showed quite a comprehensive um, understanding of what I should be eating and not. But the protein side of things is not, is probably one of the least important mm -hmm. things in, in the whole global perspective. And, if you're eating enough calories from just whole foods, you should be getting enough protein as it is. And if some people are concerned, obviously, with, um, you know, consuming enough, there's, I think there's a vegan uh, a bodybuilder who has the heaviest pound per pound deadlift in the world. And he was, um, I think he's eating one meal a day and obviously supplementing with some of the, vegan um, stuff but but again it just shows that he's not any uh weaker than than any other people and he's only consuming one meal a day or two meals a day of some sort but he fasts for 23 hours a day and obviously you don't have to go to that extreme mm. you just have to make it sustainable for you for your lifestyle mm. and the protein will sort itself out if you're eating enough whole foods and and just choose a variety of different foods like legumes, beans, which again, high in protein, uh, tofu, um, non-GMO tofu and tempehs and nuts and seeds in moderation and all of that sort of stuff. So just finding variety of foods and, and just loading up on that will give you sufficient amount of protein and amino acids that building blocks of, of, um, of, you know, of the protein yeah yeah absolutely i think you know did you find that as your activity level increased your appetite increased too so you got more calories from that perspective or have you found uh, a different approach has worked better for you oh well now i used to eat a lot of food in the morning now i actually hmm. feel so much better by eating less because mm -hmm. I, I still eat a sufficient amount of calories during the day, but I just shorten it in the shorter amount of period. Because mm -hmm. again, there is a correlation between growth hormone and insulin. So if you're in constantly spiking your insulin and eating frequently, you're actually mm -hmm. reducing the growth hormone. Right. So again, like if you want to grow, you need to tap into the hormonal responses and see mm -hmm. what your hormone is doing, what your insulin is doing, right? Because again... Mm -hmm insulin constant insulin spikes is not good in your body hmm. yeah yeah that's fascinating yeah mm -hmm. but i think you made a very imp important point there that you know even though you shortened your window of how you know often you eat you still ensure that you're going to get enough calories because i think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they look at when they start doing so any kind of fasting or intermittent fasting is they reduce their time window but they don't make up for the actual increase in calories that they need and then that's when they you hear the bad stories, right? Yes, that's for sure. Yeah, you don't starve yourself. Obviously, mm. you still consume. And if you're an athlete, you need to still make sure that you're rebuilding your your tissue and repairing it. So you need to make sure that you consume enough calories. I think uh, one of the strongest men in CrossFit, um, 
I forgot his name, uh, Rich Browning, he intermittent fasts for 12 to 16 hours a day. But hmm. he talks about that. He consumes his calories with an eight hour window. Um, obviously, you can go down the path of what some people are doing and loading up on processed food and eating junk. But you can go down the good path and you, you use um, high calorie plant foods like dates, like pistachios, like tofu, like quinoa, like potatoes and all of that sort of stuff. Because mm. again, it gives you more calories per bite um, mm. and, and enough carbs to sustain your your energy through levels through mm. the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Mm. All right, mate. We've run out of time today, but um, really appreciate you taking the time to share. Uh, I think you know if anyone uh, wants to find out more, go check out my man Serge because he's got a cracking instagram page he shows a lot of information got a great youtube channel with lots of different uh demonstration videos of how to move the body what you should do uh and um his form is always impeccable um you know jaw-dropping stuff i would say um in terms of the way he's able to move and what he's able to do with his body so um get in touch with him especially if you're on the gold coast in australia um go and see him in person you're life will definitely be changed for the better and um yeah thank you for sharing your knowledge i think you know a lot of interesting things there that people aren't aware of and i think in our in our world where we're so focused on technology we're trying to uh compensate or trying to do things that our lifestyle is making less redundant so because we're sitting so much we're trying to compensate and you know because we, we can't Flex, get our hips flexible enough we're trying to make shoes that compensate for that lack of movement and we're trying to bring clothing yeah. and all this kind of stuff that compensates for the the discrepancies or the you know the 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 lack of our ability to move anymore and that actually exactly. makes us even weaker <laughs> than yeah. than stronger you know and i think we need exactly. to go back to as i said to you and i think we were catching up before the the, the session is that you know, always go back to first principles. What would you have been doing in nature? Would you have been wearing those big? Yes, right. uh, the, the more I see, the, every single version of the new running shoe that comes out has a bigger and fatter sole. Like, I don't know how much bigger they can get now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah, uh, moon, moon boots. <laughs> moon boots. Yeah, we'll be running in moon boots soon. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, so, yeah. yeah, go back to the first principles. Look at how your body's designed to move. Look at kids moving, you know? if you look at if you look at kids like my my two-year-old you know like every time he moves towards me his like whole body's like going like this you know like moving moving around and and, and rotating and it's it's really interesting to see how much um even for me when i look at my own ability to move it's it's reduced so much over the years and it's a, it's a big wake-up call um you yeah. know to to realize that yes you know you're working in corporate jobs and you got to pay even more attention if you sit a lot and yeah. you don't actually move when you're outside okay. or you don't go outside. But I, just wanted to add, I just wanted to add one more thing and it's because mm. I know you guys for a while and what makes you real good is that you walk the talk and you always eat the healthiest food possible. And I've been to your family house and I've been eat, I've seen what you guys eat. And if anyone out there listening to this podcast and seeing what you guys do, like they are the real deal. And you will get so much benefit from their coaching because I've said I've sat in the quarantine with your brother in Brisbane <laughs> Hotel and I've seen the consultation that he does and it's all genuine and it's very um, you will you'll get so much benefits from it um, and yeah whatever your journey is I think you will benefit from Shamiz and Shakur's coaching for sure. Oh, thank you, man. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate that, man. Um, so. For everyone who's watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, slightly different topic, but I think really important because, you know, all the time you hear Shamiz and I talking about the diet, but you, if you've been paying attention, you've been noticing that a lot of our stuff is moving towards body movement and, and talking about grounding and barefoot because we're learning too. And there's so much more to health than just your diet. Don't discount your diet, but there's so much more to it 
then 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 just exactly. trying to change your diet you've got to look at everything as, as Serge talked about sleep's important the movement's important the yeah. stress is important all of that makes makes a huge difference and um yeah i think Serge incorporates a lot of the things that that you know that we're focused on as well um in his practice when he when he coaches people uh yeah. so uh thanks again for tuning in if you're watching on youtube click that subscribe button um and the little bell notification icon that gives you updates on all our recent uploads if you really enjoyed what the surge had to say give it a like uh if you didn't give it a thumbs down <laughs> you know um <laughs> but no i mean i think honestly he's he's really shared some great information here today um if you have any questions there's a comment section below so ask away you know surge will um you know if we get any questions for you surge we'll let you know and he can get in there and, and answer them as best as he can uh, and if you're listening yeah. on the podcast, please share this around so people can get um, aware of the crucial information that uh, Serge has just presented to us today. Otherwise, I hope thanks you have a wonderful day, everyone. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Serge. Thanks again for joining. I'll talk um, soon. Yeah. Talk soon, man. And for everyone watching and listening, make sure you eat plants and lots of them. Take care.